Good morning once again. God bless you all and Merry Christmas and thank you so much worship team. Our, uh, our little church has two talented worship teams. Isn't that awesome? What's the Lord doing here? Whatever it is, we're very grateful. That's for sure. I'd like you to open up, please, to the book of Exodus, chapter 20. And uh, Lord willing, we'll look at two more of the Ten Commandments. And if the Lord has mercy this morning, by the time we're done, it's going to tie in real nice to what we're thinking about at Christmas time. Namely, that God was manifest in the flesh. That God himself, God Almighty, in, in the person of his son Jesus, actually took a human nature. He still has that human nature to, to, right to this very hour. There is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Uh, Lord willing, on Christmas Eve, I want to talk a little bit about that. I want to do a short devotional on Christmas Eve, and we want to talk about what it means to us that God became a, became a man, became a person, a human being, we'll say. He always was a person, but that, that he would take on a human nature. We kind of live in a world where uh, it seems that the powers that be want to almost make us feel ashamed for being human. We're messing up the environment. It, you know, you should be ashamed to even be a human. And God says, no, no. There's something magnificent about being a human being. I, I know every human on the earth right now has a sin nature. We, we struggle with sin, but that is, uh, that's an aberration, isn't it? That's not what you don't need to have a sin nature to be a human being. The Lord Jesus took, took a sin nature, and he was never touched with sin. It's amazing. Well, let's get uh, into the Ten Commandments here. We are looking at the fourth commandment. Remember, we've looked at the first three already. No other gods besides the true God, and you're not to make graven images to worship those things. And, and uh, well, you're not supposed to take the name of the Lord in vain, not to, not to misuse his name. Well, now we're looking at this uh, fourth commandment. Let's take a look at it. Verse 8, Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day, or the seventh day, is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. That's the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Now right here we, we had a little problem, don't we? If, if we still believe that the, the Ten Commandments, and by extension the whole Mosaic Law, is still binding on the Christian, and many Christians think they are, what are we to do with this commandment? This is the command to observe the Sabbath day. Now, which day is the Sabbath? Anyone know? Saturday. The Lord Jesus was raised from the dead on the first day of the week, that Sunday. That means that Sabbath day is Saturday. How many of us here are obeying Sabbath law the way Moses prescribed it to us? I'm not. Why? Am I... Does that make me a sinner? Well, I don't think so. I mean, other things make me a sinner, but not that one. And we need to talk about this. We are not under the Mosaic law anymore as Christians. We are, under, we are not under law, we're under grace. But we are still to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love neighbor as ourselves. Remember Paul said on these two? Hang all, Jesus said, on these two hang all the law and the prophets. And Paul says, whoever loves another has fulfilled the law. So let's talk about this. What is the purpose of the Mosaic law? Well, I listed off a number of them. One of them was to keep Israel distinct so that we would identify the Savior of the world when he came. He was born into the nation of Israel. And this Sabbath law, this really did keep Israel distinct, didn't it? I mean, how can you have fellowship with these people? If you were a pagan from one of the surrounding nations, how could you have fellowship with an Israelite. Hey, let's go do something. No, I can't. It's Sabbath. Hey, let, come over to my house and have dinner. No, I can't. It's not kosher food. I mean, these, these laws and regulations and technicalities and stipulations really kept Israel a distinct entity. And that was part of the reason for that law. The Sabbath law kept Israel wholly apart, separate 
It was supposed to. They were always struggling with this. But uh, it did its job. By the time Jesus Christ was born into the world, Israel was still Israel. Struggling with problems, yes, but she was to be a witness to the nations. And did you notice, look at verse 11. In six days the Lord made heaven, earth, sea, and all that in them is. This Sabbath law is, is connected to God as creator. This is, a, this is a major, major issue. It was a major issue for the, for the Jewish people. It was a major issue for the early church. We start with God as the creator. And because God is the creator of the heaven and the earth, there is nothing untouched by him on this, on this planet. God touches everything. He is sovereign over the whole created order. And you know, that was the message that God gave to Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah chapter 10, he said, Jeremiah, this is what you tell the nations. The gods that did not make the heaven and the earth, they will perish from under these heavens and from off the earth. There's only one creator, and Israel was supposed to teach that to the nations. The church is supposed to teach that to the nations. There's only one creator, and he commands our attention and obedience, doesn't he? He should. And so Israel was commanded by God, okay, Israel, one day in seven, you're going to give your creator special attention, special honor on this Sabbath day. And that was supposed to be uh, a light to the Gentile nations around her. Now, this Old Testament law, of course, it's set aside in the life of the Christian, uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't observe Sabbath if you want to. You see, you're free. I know a lot of Christians who really feel that God would have them observe Saturday as a Sabbath day. They don't do any work that day. They set that day aside to give God special attention. And you know what? They're absolutely free to do that. I mean, this is the whole theme of the book of Galatians. Remember Paul's a short epistle to the Galatian believers. He said, you know, walk in freedom, you people. Don't, don't get, uh, don't get um, wrapped in chains again to the, to the law. You're free from that. But, but you, can, you can certainly obey the law if you want to. The, the point is you're free. They sometimes call the, the book of Galatians the Magna Carta of Christian freedom. Okay? You're free. Or you're free not to. That's the issue. Now flip ahead, please, to the book of Colossians. Let's get Paul's perspective on this. Colossians, the second chapter. We've read several of these verses already. Uh, we're going to read a little further this time. Colossians chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians chapter 2. <clears throat> Colossians 2, we begin at verse uh, 13. And to me, this is quite definitive here. Let's read it, and let's really think about what the Lord is telling us here, okay? Colossians 2, 13. Paul tells those Christians, and by extension, of course, he's talking to us too, right? He says, And you, being dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle over them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or, in, or regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. I wonder if you caught that. All these things in the Old Testament that we're reading, all these stipulations and regulations, these were all teaching aids, pedagogical aids, teaching aids to point us to Jesus. And now that he's come, we're no longer under the law. We're no longer under that Mosaic law. Now the principles upon which that law was founded, th those are eternal. Love is eternal. Love is not an afterthought. Love is not something introduced uh, as, as though for all eternity love never existed and all of a sudden it did. No, there was love relationship within the Trinity from all eternity. That's what makes love so ultimate. Loving God with everything and loving neighbor as self, those things are eternal. But to obey the Sabbath law as Moses prescribed it, I do not believe that that's binding on the Christian today. That was a shadow, but the substance is Jesus Christ. Now, I can just hear the the argument, right? Because every time I speak at a conference, there's usually one guy there, at least one, 
uh, that still really believes that as a Christian, he is bound by the Mosaic Law. And he thinks he needs to observe all the feasts of Israel, and he thinks he needs to obey Sabbath, and, and he thinks he needs to become a Jew to be, to be a Christian. And, you know, the Bible is very clear. You don't need to. You don't need to. Uh, God is the God of the Gentiles also, Paul tells us. And, in fact, the book of Acts contains a a fantastic chapter, namely chapter 15, where these issues were uh, brought to light and they were discussed by the early church. And definite resolutions were come to, and a letter was written to Gentile believers, and guys were free. You're not free to do everything you want under the sun, but you are free from uh, the stipulations of the Mosaic Law. Now, one of the common objections here uh, is that Yes, indeed, the Mosaic Law was introduced into earth history, into human history, and therefore could be set aside, and yet Sabbath Law was not. Sabbath Law, we're told, comes before the Mosaic Law. So this one persists. Now I want you to listen very carefully to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 5. Deuteronomy, the last book of Moses. It's Moses himself writing this. And you can turn if you like, you don't have to. But Deuteronomy chapter 5, we have Moses giving the law for a second time now. This is another generation uh, now that's come out of Egypt. And Moses is about to repeat that Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And he says something very, very interesting. Deuteronomy 5, beginning at verse 2. He said, The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. Now that's Mount Sinai. That's another word for Sinai. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are here today, all of us who are alive. And then he goes on right after that to give the Ten Commandments. He said, this was given at Mount Sinai for the first time. It was not given to our fathers. So I do not believe that this Sabbath law uh, predates the Mosaic law. Just like the Mosaic law, it's been set aside now in the life of the Christian, now that Christ has come. And I hope we understand that now. Don't, you know... a lot of people say, let's just follow the Ten Commandments. Well, then you need, that means you're under Sabbath law too then, doesn't it? I say, no, we are going to follow Jesus Christ, the foundation for this law. And we're going to exemplify what this law was really getting at here. Namely, love God with everything you have and love neighbor as yourself. Right? Now, hopefully that makes sense to us here. Hopefully that resolves some confusion. Okay? In the book of Romans, chapter 14, Paul basically says, look, one man esteems one day above another, and to another man, every day is the same. And then Paul says, let each be convinced in his own mind. If you believe that Saturday is a special day, and, you'd have, and God would have you to uh, honor and respect him in a special way on that day, then you go for it. That's fine. And no one here is going to judge you for that. But please don't judge your neighbor who's a Christian who doesn't feel that, who doesn't feel the great shepherd talking to him in that way. You understand that? Paul says, look, each be convinced in your own mind there. Uh, In James, the fourth chapter, James basically tells us too, uh, was it verse 17? He says, uh, to him that knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it's sin. If the Lord is speaking to you that you need to set special time aside on a particular day, then you do that. You're certainly free to hear the voice of the shepherd. Okay, does this make sense to us? I hope this makes sense here, friends. We walk in freedom here. Not freedom to do anything we want, but we're free to listen to Jesus and and do as he commands us, right? Okay, so, regarding Sabbath law, what does it mean uh, to us? Does this mean we are free not to come to church? Does this mean we we are free? It's just me and Jesus. A lot of people think like this. You know, it's just me and Jesus. I don't need to ever go to church. I don't need to ever gather with the saints. Well, obviously not, okay? Uh, Which day of the week you gather, that's up to you. Uh, But as a matter of fact, the the Bible has uh, some uh, pretty good historic narrative there for us that acts as a pretty good object lesson, doesn't it? And what I'm getting at is simply this. If you read the book of Acts, you're going to see on several occasions the church is meeting on the first day of the week. They're meeting on the first day of the week. And Paul talks in his epistles about regular gatherings of the people of God. And we kind of put this together and we say, you know, I think the church ought to be meeting regularly, and why don't we follow the example of the early church and get together on the first day of the week? In fact, there is a command in the book of Hebrews to do this very thing, to, namely to gather for corporate prayer and worship and the receiving of instruction from the Word of God. You remember the, the book of Revelation, it opens with some uh, 
some pretty interesting words there, right at the beginning of the chapter. It says, this book, uh, there's a blessing for him who reads and for they who hear. Do you remember reading that in the book of Revelation? There's a blessing there for him who reads and they who hear. Now you listen carefully to that. It sounds like someone's reading and, and he, others are listening. The church, from, from the earliest times, the church was gathering for prayer and worship. And as Christians, we're just not free to do anything we want to do spiritually in this life. We're not just gonna, it's not just going to be you and Jesus. Jesus has a body on the earth called his bride. It, it's the church. And we need each other. And the church needs its members. And the members need one another. And uh, I don't know how else to put it. There's no lone rangers in the kingdom of God, is there? We simply need each other. It's, it's God's plan. And Jesus said, I will build my church. Gates of hell will not prevail. You see, Jesus, you're, you're a fantastic architect. You're putting us together like living stones into this wonderful thing that will be called the temple of the living God, the place for the spirit of God to reside. You see, you just can't uh, do it by yourself, can you? And people pray, if people come to my home or they call me and they say, John, I need some prayer today and and I pray with them, and sometimes I need prayer, and I pray with people, and, and you feel better after, don't you? Sometimes it, feels, it just feels better just to talk to another Christian. You know, it's the Lord's doing, isn't it? And it's marvelous in our eyes. Regular gathering of the church. I'm reading from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, beginning at verse 24. Paul says here, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. See, there's always this thought before our eyes that it's not always going to be same old, same old. The sun comes up, the sun goes down, the sun goes up. You know what I mean? You go to work, you earn your pay, you come home, you have dinner, you go to bed, you do it again. This does not go on forever like this. There's a day approaching. The Bible says it. One day the Lord Jesus will take a stand upon the earth. I know it feels like things are never going to change, but God says it, and I can proclaim it on his authority. Things will change. A spectacular, wonderful, beautiful, welcome change for the people of God. Yes. And the Bible instructs us, until that day comes, hey, Christians, why don't you encourage one another? Help one another. Call one another back to the, to the Bible. Speak a word in season from the scriptures to encourage, maybe correct one another. All in love, though, right? All in love. What a wonderful thing the church of God is. What a wonderful thing the head of the church is, the Lord Jesus. Well, the example we see in the early church is they're meeting on the first day of the week. Why are they doing that? Well, because the Lord Jesus was raised to life on the first day of the week. That was the day when he proclaimed very clearly his victory over sin, the flesh, and the devil, the grave. He, he conquered all those things. Mankind's most hated and feared enemies, destroyed, conquered by that resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And the early church recognized that, began to meet. I mean, he made his appearances on that, on that day, the first day of the week. And you see, there's tremendous apologetic value to this too, isn't there? The early church was, to a man, Jewish. Jewish people, I mean, the Sabbath law to these people really meant something. Remember, the Lord Jesus was in constant trouble with the religious leaders of his day because he was doing what? He was preaching and healing on the Sabbath. He said, you're a lawbreaker. And of course, Jesus had words for them. I mean, you don't, you're not going to out-debate Jesus, are you? <laughs> he gave man his intellect. You are not going to out-debate Jesus. The stream does not flow higher than its source. And he said, listen here. If you have an ox or a sheep or something that falls into a hole on the Sabbath, you'll pull it out, won't you? Well, don't, I mean, don't give me a hard time for healing people on the Sabbath. A man is of much greater value than a sheep or an ox or something. Right. The point is that the Sabbath law really meant something to the Jewish people. And to change the day of worship from a Saturday to a Sunday meant that something as spectacular as the creation of the world must have happened. Remember, you read it here, didn't you? Verse 11, in six days the Lord God made heaven, earth, and sea, and all that in them is. And therefore now we have this Sabbath law. You're supposed to remember the creation. 
Remember the Creator. He's given you an instruction here. The early church to a man was Jewish and yet saw no problem with moving the standard day of worship to the Sunday. And I see tremendous apologetic value there in that. Something amazing must have happened on that first day of the week. We say yes. The Christian says yes, of course. Death was conquered once and for all by the sinless Son of God. Of course, something amazing happened that day. Well, in the Old Testament, the Sabbath day was the seventh day. That was the day where special attention was to be given to God. Well, now today, as New Covenant Christians, guess what? Every day is a day where you give special attention to the Lord. You don't just set aside one day in seven, but everything you do in this life is supposed to be focused on Jesus. This is terribly hard for us to get our minds around. It's hard for me, friend. I still think that there's a difference in my life between the secular and the religious. We drive to church, it's religious music. You drive home, it's maybe secular music on the radio. Oh, now we've done that part, we've done the religious part, and now we can get back to norm normal life, whatever that is. You know, that, that's not very Christian, though. That's not legitimately Christian to operate like that. It's not like your life is, um, imagine your life as a, as a box with a bunch of little honeycombs in the box. And they're all secular, and you have one there called religious. This is where you do the religious things. This is where you come to church. You know, maybe you go to prayer meeting or, or something like that. But everything else is untouched by Jesus. There's so many Christians that operate like this. You know what Jesus says? He says, I want the whole thing. Destroy all those little divisions you've got there. I want the whole thing. When Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, what does he say there? Do you, do you know the verse? Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Is that convicting? To the extent that you take these verses seriously, that's convicting. I don't think that I right now am doing everything to the glory of God. I wonder how you're doing with that. Are, can you say you're doing everything to the glory of God? If you can, you're doing better than I am. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul writes this. He says, whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Are we doing that? Am I doing that? Every last thing you do, you've got Christ in mind, and you're doing it to honor him. All that we say, do, and think is supposed to be holy. It's supposed to be God-honoring. God demands absolute perfection. With him, the wicked cannot dwell. God is angry with the wicked every day. God has a constant uh, disposition of hatred towards sin. Wrath, the Bible calls it. And every time we fall short of God's perfection, that's what we call sin. It's called hamartia in the Greek, a missing of the mark. The Bible says we are to be holy as God is holy. Peter tells us that, quoting Leviticus. How are we doing? You know, you look at these verses, and to the extent that you're very um, serious about them, it's kind of convicting. And I think we have only three responses to them. Three responses that I can think of. There's only three options. How are we going to respond to God's demand from us of absolute holiness? I think the first thing we can do, if we are honest, and we take a look at these passages, and what God demands, and we look at our own lives, and we see that we continually are falling short, the first thing we could do is just utterly despair about this. That was Martin Luther's great problem. How do I make myself clean in the sight of God? He struggled with it. And he, he confessed his sins to... Uh, to other monks. He would sit there and confess. It would be hours on end. He's confessing, and he, by the time he was done, he was loathing himself. He just couldn't get to the end of the list. And then finally, finally, the light shone into his life, and he realized, there's nothing I can do. God has done it. You know? But the point is, for some people, when you're taking these verses seriously, and you're looking at your life aright, there's just despair. You just despair over it. I can't do anything to clean myself up. The second option you have, and it's an option, and many people take it, is to simply deny and suppress the truth. Deny, suppress, reject what God has said in terms of what he demands from, uh, from us. His demand for, protect, for perfection, we just simply set it aside and say, well, this is ridiculous. No one can live up to these standards. 
That's just proof that the book is a human invention. Anyways, what benevolent God would operate like this and demand this kind of perfection from his creatures? There's many who have gone that route. You remember the young man that I debated a few months ago? I mean, the, the man was raised in a Christian home. Uh, he was part of the worship team. He was a counselor at Bible camp. Uh, he knew the scriptures. He knew what God demanded of him. And uh, I'm not doing him a disservice here. He wrote all this down and put it in print for people to read. He's, he just said, I got sick and tired of loathing myself. And one day, walking across a busy street, it hit me that I am, I am to be comfortable in my own skin. And so he decided he would just disdain God's moral imperatives for his life. Well, that's an option. You don't have to loathe yourself. You don't have to despair. You can just say, well, I'm not going to believe any of this. Of course, that, I think you're going to end up despairing anyways, right? I think you're going to end up wandering into utter confusion. Uh, if you go this route, how do, you, how do you really, in the final analysis, how are you going to tell right from wrong anyways? What is moral goodness? What is right? What is wrong? How should I order my life? What am I to think? How am I to speak? How should I respond to this particular situation or another? Without God's word to guide us, you're just lost in a sea of uh, hopeless confusion, utter darkness. That's not really an option either, is it? I think, friends, the third option is the only realistic option here, and that is to come to Christ for salvation and forgiveness. It's very simple. Any Sunday school child could, could probably tell you that. It's not real complicated. God created a very good world, created people upright, but man has sought out many inventions, the Bible tells us, Ecclesiastes chapter 7. We've fallen, we're imperfect, we've got a sin nature now, we could never reside in God's heaven with him, not, not sinful as we are. We hardly ever make a right choice that's completely right. We need God to step in and fix this problem, just like a fast runner uh, needs to slow his pace down for the slow runner to catch him. We needed a holy God to do something to bridge the gap between himself and sinful people. And the only viable option here is to say, Jesus, I think I'm going to come to you now. I think I'm going to accept what you've done for me. That's the wise option. And Jesus says in Matthew 11, 28, remember the verse. Come, Jesus said, come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? I'll give you rest. Rest from what? From hauling around this great burden we call your sin debt. And I'll give you rest from what? Trying to earn salvation. Jesus says, you just forget those things. They're needless. Forget trying to earn salvation. You can't do it anyway. And stop lugging around this sin load that you've got on your back. And stop carrying around guilt and self-loathing. Forget it. Come to me. I'll wash you clean. Come to me. I'll give you rest. That's a Savior that I want to follow. That's a God worth worshiping. And he changes things. I remember I was dialoguing with a group of atheists at this, uh, this outdoor event, and, and this lady asked me, well, how did you come to, did, were you raised in a Christian home? She thought I was brainwashed since the time I was little, right? And she says, well, were you raised in a Christian home? I said, no. We were, I was raised in a home that didn't care about God one way or another. I said, but you know what? He, he stepped into my life, and he made a difference. Oh, that's just some psychological thing that happened to you. I said, lady, you're welcome to believe that. You see, in, in terms of your worldview, in terms of your ultimate faith commitments, you're interpreting me. You're interpreting what I am, I'm telling you, right? And in the final analysis, I'm just nothing more than an accident in the cosmic scheme, aren't I? I'm just a glorified pond scum. That's what you think of me. I said, well, let me interpret you. You're a creature made in God's image and likeness. But God has some moral commands for you, and you don't like that, and you're denying and suppressing the truth that you know to be true. This is not just a psychological thing that happens to people. It's not just that, just that you get religion. I was talking with a friend of mine from high school just recently on the telephone. He called me up from uh, Saskatchewan. He really was from Saskatchewan, by the way, <laughs> working in the oil fields. And um, it's, it's um, if I could just share this, I wasn't planning on sharing this, but I would like to. In high school, he was athletic and good-looking, and all the girls wanted to date him, and I was not. And I wanted to be him. 
we were good friends, and I would dress like him and sound like him and talk like him and walk like him. And today, he drinks, he smokes, he's sad. He has only his girlfriend. His family wants nothing to do with him. And he came near death a couple times because of his unhealthy lifestyle. He's killing himself by degrees, you know. And he doesn't look anything like he used to look. He's just a pale shadow, a shell, really, of what he used to be. The party scene, hey? What was so cool in high school has become, what, the slow bullet that's killing him, really. And he called me up, and he was drunk, and Christmas time is very difficult, and he's crying to me on the phone. And, and I thought in my heart, thank you, Jesus, for coming into my life, for calling me to believe in you. You must understand, friends, I don't see myself as better than this person. He's not, I'm not better than him. And God doesn't love me more than he loves him. But by God's grace, somehow, I'm in the kingdom of God right now. And I talked to him about it, and I gave him the gospel again, because I've done it before. And he says, well, I'm glad your faith has helped you. I said, no, 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 my faith hasn't helped me. My faith is worthless. It's the object of my faith. You understand that? This is a terrible, a terrible misconception, friends. You, you don't put your faith in your faith. Please don't do that. Put your faith in Jesus. He makes a difference. He made, a, he made the difference in my life. He made a tremendous difference to me. I came to him and he gave me rest. He washed me clean. The burden's gone. He did what he said he would do. The Bible's very clear about it. Romans chapter 5, Ephesians 2. Your works can't save you, so just put those things to rest. And Jesus offers you, what, a Sabbath rest from those kind of labors, from the labor of hauling around your sin debt and from the labor of trying to earn salvation. He gives you a Sabbath rest, an ongoing perpetual Sabbath rest. Okay? Please go to the book of Hebrews. Now, this is on your bulletin, isn't it? Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Let's look at these precious verses here. Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to put this Sabbath law into New Testament Christian perspective here. By the way, I can hardly wait till we get to the book of Hebrews. It's one of my favorite books in the Bible. We're already in the second book, so how long can it take, right? <laughs> right. Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Have it there, beginning at verse 9. Hebrews 4, 9. Now, in the context, the writer is talking to Christians about mixing the message that you hear from God with faith. You need to exercise faith. Not that faith is some power source or anything like that, but God has chosen to respond to faith. And so we must exercise faith in the hearing of God's word. This is the whole context here. And um, specifically, the writer is talking about the Exodus, and that's where we are, right, in the Bible, in, in the book of Exodus. But... Uh, Take a look here, please, at verse 9, Hebrews 4, 9. Paul says, There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us, therefore, be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. And there he's talking about the Israelites. When they left Egypt, they became terribly disobedient. And Paul says, let's not follow that example. Uh, but take a look at verse, uh, verse 10 there. He says, he who has entered his rest, that is, the person that enters Christ's rest, he has ceased from his works just as God ceased from his works on the seventh day. We're talking about works of hauling around a sin debt and works of trying to earn salvation. No more of that. We enter a perpetual Sabbath rest that Christ alone can provide for us. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean you sit around doing nothing. God has prepared good works for you to walk in, uh, real kingdom-building uh, works on the earth, God-honoring works, preaching the gospel, defending the gospel, helping the poor. We're still doing those things. But we are resting from trying to earn salvation. That, we understand this now, right? Is that clear to everybody? Okay. Very quickly now, let's look, go back to Exodus chapter 20. Very quickly. And I do want to at least touch on this next command here, because now we're, we're going to soon get to the second table of the law. Remember, 
Ten Commandments, five on each table. And uh, the fifth one is almost a transition commandment. The first batch deal with man's relation to God. The second batch deal primarily with man's relation to man. And here we have a transition. This is a law now to honor father and mother. See that? Verse 12, Exodus 20, 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Now, how many of you are wiping the sweat off your brow thinking, whew, I'm glad the Ten Commandments have been set aside. I don't have to honor mother and father. For those of us whose parents have driven us crazy from time to time, we almost want to breathe a sigh of relief. Oh, great, I don't have to honor mother, father. I can dishonor them if I want to. Is that what we're saying? Is that what your pastor's telling you? No, absolutely not. I believe the Mosaic Law has been set aside, but not the eternal principles upon which they are founded. And remember, the greatest of all is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I'll tell you what, if you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you will love the things that he has created and ordained. And one of the most precious things that God has created and ordained is the family unit. God created the world, he made a man and a woman, and they were to have children. That was beautiful in God's eyes. Mother, father, children, a family, and various roles and functional distinctions in the home and family. That's God ordained. It's beautiful in the eyes of God. And so we are going to love the things that God loves. We will love the family unit. Is there any wonder in our day and age right now that, that one, of the, one of the most aggressively attacked institutions right now by the secular world is the family? We hardly know what a family is anymore. What is a family? What, is this, what does it look like? It's just up for debate. What is a marriage? What is it? What's a mom? What's a dad? What are their roles? Is there roles? Is there functional distinction? It's just totally up in the air. I'm not surprised. God, it was God's idea. It was beautiful in his eyes. He uses it as an analogy. That's how beautiful home and family is to God. He uses it as a, an object lesson, an analogy to the relationship he has with his people. He's called our father. We're called his children. For the church of Christ, we're, I mean, we're considered to be the bride of Christ. He's our husband. We're his, his bride. And did you know that Jesus was born into a family? Do you know that? I mean, and think about it. John the Baptist, who's the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, remember Jesus said so. Of those born of women, there's not one greater than John. And John the Baptist told those that had come to his baptism, he said, God is able of those stones to raise up children to Abraham. God, you think God can do it? I do. But as a matter of fact, when the second person of the Trinity took a human nature and was born into the world, guess what? He was born into a family with a mom and a dad. Because that's the way it's to be done. Now we know people make mistakes. And tragedy strikes. And there are single parent families. And no one here is looking down on those people. And we're not judging those people. We're just simply saying there's an ideal here. There's this thing called the Genesis account of creation. There's a Garden of Eden narrative there. There's something called the ideal to which God is moving us. You've got to remember, this is the, that was the perfect world. That was how things are supposed to be. And Jesus was born into such a family. That's how he started his sinless life as a bona fide member of the human race. Home and family, mom and dad, functional distinctions, that unit has been sanctified by the word of God, the written word, and the incarnate word. And we don't take it lightly, these attacks on the family. And we're not going to go out on a witch hunt, but let's, um, let's rejoice and honor God who created these things, who ordained them, and let's honor the men and women who are in these roles. That's the point. Uh, you don't always have to agree with mom and dad. Mom and dad make mistakes, but you honor them for the offices that they, under God, are occupying right now. Okay? Do you honor 
um, Justin Trudeau? You should. No matter what you think about his policies, the man under God now is occupying an office that God has ordained. So you pray for that man. And you honor him. If he was to walk in here, you'd honor him for the office he occupies. You honor mom and dad for the office they occupy. Now hopefully it's a loving home where they love you and you love them. But the commandment here is very clear. You, you should honor them. And even if it's been set aside, the letter of the law, you honor God, don't you? And so you honor parents. And when Jesus was born into the world, guess what? When he was a child, he submitted himself to his parents. That's part of a sinless life, you know? He was subject to his parents, the Bible says. Can you imagine? He's the sovereign of the universe. The entire universe hangs on his very word. And yet he was born into the world, and he submitted himself to his mother and his adopted father, Joseph. Isn't that amazing? So we must honor our parents as fellow humans for whom Christ died, and we must respect them for the honorable offices that they're holding right now. Does that make sense to us all? I hope that makes sense to you, especially at, at this time of year. At this time of year, we're thinking about that sinless Son of God who came into the world. He came into the world to save sinners, of whom all of us at one point or another consider ourselves the chief, right? Okay. Next week under God, we want to try to get through maybe the last of the commandments. We'll try, we'll try for it. And then we're going to get into this very, very controversial issue of Mosaic civil law, including this thing called slavery. The Bible's an immoral book. It orchestrates uh, or ordains slavery. Look at all these horrible Mosaic laws. Oh, well, we're going to talk about that. We're, we're going to bring some light to that, okay? All right, so that's a lot to think about this morning. Let's have a word of prayer, okay? Do we have another song, you guys? Oh, very good. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we come to your throne of grace now uh, to thank you for the wonderful truths that um, you confronted us with this morning, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for um, the sinless Son of God who came into the world to save sinners. We thank you for your word, Lord, for your commandments. Thank you, Lord, that your Ten Commandments still teach us. They, they still do instruct us. They still point us to the Savior. We thank you, Lord, for... Uh, for the reminder this morning that, uh, Lord Jesus, because of what you did on the cross, there is a perpetual Sabbath rest that you call us to enter into. Uh, but Lord, we thank you that uh, we don't have to carry our sin burden around anymore. We don't have to carry around guilt anymore. We thank you, Lord, that uh, by your blood you wash people clean. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you call this a gift, and you make it clear that gifts are to simply be accepted and not to be earned Thank you, Lord, for the great Apostle Paul who gives us more information about this than anybody. Thank you for ordaining and orchestrating the writing of your precious book, the Bible, that confronts us with these wonderful truths. This morning, Lord, we ask for your help to remember, to believe, to order our steps in accordance with these truths. We thank you, Lord God, this morning. Please accept our worship, our maker. In Christ's precious name, we pray it all. Amen. Amen.